So I've, um, I'm titling the message today, The Beautiful Tree of Death. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve got, or Eve actually got tempted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I've just come to a deeper understanding on what that is, and I'm going to share about that today. Now, as a foundation, I want to say this. The Lord Jesus Christ, or the Fa Father God, made a promise unto man. And the promise that God made unto man is that they will be partakers of His divine nature. That is the promise God made man. So, God made man. After He made man, He said, Man, you will have my divine nature. I promise you that. So, by His doing, we will have that and not by our own doing. It will be by the very doing of God. That is how we will have the divine nature. The whole emphasis on having God's quality of life, on having peace, on having joy, on having a holy life, is not on you. It is on God. God promised us that we will have His divine nature. Uh, Second Peter clearly says that by precious promises we are made partakers of the divine nature. Many of us might be going through hard times, many of us might be struggling with certain things in, the, in our lives where we feel we don't have victory, where we feel we've messed up, where we feel we don't do things the way we're supposed to do it. Listen, you've got a God that made you a promise and His promise is that He will give you His quality of life as a free gift. That's God's promise to man. There's nothing you can do to make God do it. The only thing you can do in the presence of a God that promised you His life is to believe Him. Sin would be defined in not believing God when He promised you something like that. That would be sin. And whenever, I, when I look at my own life, whenever I see shortcomings, whenever I see anything that's not in line with the character of God, I basically just say, God, just love me out of this. And that's how God will take us out of that. Because God is not a sin conscious God. He's not a God that gives you a list of rules and tells you, this is my list of rules, this is what you must do in order to qualify before me. You know, it has never been about being qualified before God. When God made man, man was already qualified before God. The thing was, what will produce life in man and what will not produce life? What produces life is God. And what produces death is an unbelief that God will produce the life in you. And then trying by your own effort to bring forth the life you behold in God. So, know this. God promised Abraham and said to Abraham, Abraham, you will be a great nation. And then the Bible says, and Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And now the sons of Abraham are those that believe like Abraham believed. God came and promises us that He will raise us from the dead and that we will be like the resurrected Jesus on account of God's power and not ours. And those who can believe that God will make it true in our lives, they are the sons of Abraham. They are what the Bible calls the true Jew. Now the Bible says there are those that say they are Israelites, but they are not, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. Amazing. I don't want to get into that today. <laughs> uh, what we need to realize is that God promises us. God doesn't sit with a command. This is the fruit of the Spirit. You see the fruit of the Spirit? Now you better start to bear the fruit of the Spirit. No. The fruit of the Spirit is God's promise to you that he will bring forth in you when he lives in you now the question is how do we get it right for God to live in us how does something live in us if something is physical and it needs to live in you physically you physically need to take it and put it inside you but the Bible says God is spirit now how does a spirit live in you? Very simple, through belief. 
when you believe in a spiritual concept or in a spiritual truth it enters your life if I look at uh, you know this thing we saw on the SABC where they robbed the people while um, I don't know if you saw that they're busy doing a live broadcast and here they come with guns and steal <laughs> steal the guy's cell phones and laptops and stuff um, you know when I look at that and I see the fear that it brings and I start to believe that we're just living in an unsafe country it's never gonna go well and all those kind of things when I believe that then that deed enters my heart and then that deed and the truth about that deed will shape my life and give birth to a life of fear in me what actually takes place is that action starts to live in me and the way it's got access to my life the door into my life is belief I believe the message it says in the very same way God says that Jesus is the Word of God the only way God can enter your life is when you believe his word and his word I don't want to define as the Bible I want to define his word as the resurrected Jesus where the innocence of God put on display in the human Jesus Christ is the word of God about you your sins are forgiven all of your sins the righteousness of God or let me put it this way the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in you by the law being taken out of the way where there is no law there is no transgression okay that is all yours and God will make you his righteousness meaning that God will manifest his life in you by the power of the resurrection now in everything I said how much focus is on God and how much focus is on you all the focus is on God God promises you and because of our design the moment we believe it it does something for us politicians use this principle very effectively when they see people are very upset and they burning places down and they're very upset what they do is they just come with new promises and as they come with new promises then those who believe the promise find that the promise gives birth to hope in their heart and then that promise lives in them God has done the very same thing the only difference between what God does and what a politician does is the politician doesn't have any truth or he doesn't have anything that has already been done by which he can make his promise he doesn't have the money in the bank if you want to put it that way where God has got the money in the bank he's got a resurrected human being that became the sin of the whole world and when even while being the sin of the whole world in the state where he is the son of the whole world the spirit possessed the power to raise him from the dead so that every sinner in the world can have the hope that Christ can raise him from the dead by the Holy Spirit and that is the gospel that's the good news that we can believe that's what we can tell people is that your sin has been taken away God is not a sin conscious God and he promises you his life and he shall bring it forth in you what is the righteous thing to do in the presence of a God that promises you that number one to believe him what would be an unrighteous thing to do to try and build up your own life by your own works in the presence of a father that has promised you a life for free <laughs> okay now um, with this said and as an introduction I want to just have your mind flooded and founded in that you can do nothing of yourself and that all the fruit that will come forth in you will be on account of a very humble loving God that serves you with his life by living his life in you let me give you an example of that a good friend of mine <coughs> um, that he was with me in Bible school he came and visited me last week I think it was last week and he bought himself this very nice BMW M3 the V8 with the superchargers and everything 
So he stopped there and I said to him, you need to take me for a ride in this car. He says, no, I want you to drive the car. He wants me to drive the car. He says, but I'm too scared to drive with you. You can take it by yourself. <laughs> and I did take it, you know. So, <clears throat> very nice car. <laughs> Amazing when the, once the Lord has set you free, you know, that I, I, I could enjoy the car, but I don't want one. It's amazing how it works. Well, anyway, so what I want to say about that is when the Lord comes and He promises His life, He's not putting you behind the wheel. He'll drive the car and you'll sit with Him and you will feel the rush and the power and the adrenaline of that car that He drives. He's not giving you the wheel. What that means is, he doesn't tell you, live a good life, and so by living the good life, you will experience my life. What he's telling you is, you are the vessel, I will come and live in you, and then you will come to the point where you will say, at the end of the day, oh my goodness, the life I live, in other words, you're saying you're living it, is not I who live, but it's Christ who's living in me and now I'm experiencing the union of the Trinity inside my life for I've been included into that life by God, not my doing. Yes. Amen. Okay, now we're going to explain the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to first go to the uh, story of the prodigal son. I'm going to read from Luke 15 verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided them his living. That's very, very important to understand. He says, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And, the, and Jesus cleverly uses this word, and he divided to them his living not just the goods, he gave him their life. It was more than just stuff, and we will explain that. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country there, um, and there wasted it with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. He he went and joined himself to the citizens of that country and sent him into a far field to feed swine. He would want to fill his belly with the husks of the swine that the swine ate, and no man gave it unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? Now let's look at the two sons and the scenario wherein they were born into, the house they were born into. If you look at the two sons, you will find that they did not contribute anything into establishing the kingdom of the Father. They were born into that kingdom. They didn't help the Father to get the farm. They didn't help the Father to get the goat. They didn't help the Father to get the fatted calf. They didn't help the father to build the house. They were born into an already established business, if you want to call it that way, or family. They were born into a place where um, the way the father does things was already established. They didn't come and establish it. They were born into a system already there. It's like I said to my children, you know, um, well, let, let me start at the beginning how this actually started. I was going away a lot preaching the gospel when Aubrey was still very small. And he would become like rebellious. I wouldn't say rebellious, just two years old, very naughty. And then when I come home, I felt guilty to discipline him. And then there was a lady that she had six or seven children and she told me, she said to me, listen, you need to understand something. I see you feel guilty and you don't want to discipline him. But you must, be, you must realize that you'll have to teach him that he's been born into a missionary's home. And even if his father travels, it doesn't mean he doesn't have to behave. 
He's been, he's been born into that house. In the very same way, we, or, or these two sons, were born into the house of the Father. They were not the creators of the house. They had no, nothing to do with building the house. The only thing they have is the benefit of experiencing everything the Father has already established. They are born into the system by which the Father reached all the success He already has. They didn't contribute to that at all. Let's talk about just a little bit about the Father's house. The Father's house, if we liken it to God, is a house of righteousness where the Father has got equity of character and act, where the Father, um, the spirit inside the house, so the spirit inside that house is a spirit of love. So here is a father that is a friendly guy. Here is a father that is a loving person. Here is a father that's not a sin conscious person. Here is a father that is very generous. He's willing to share his whole kingdom with his sons. He gives everything. We find, and if we look at a normal family life, that, um, and we take from this parable that the father was a good father. So his wife, he would have been good to his wife. In the circle between the father and the mother and the children is absolute unity, humbleness, kindness, love, um, all the fruit of the Spirit. There's not selfishness, there's meekness, there is trust, there's servanthood. The father serves his own sons by everything that he has ever done, uh, um, making it available for them. The father it's even good to the servants. The servants, after they've paid everything that they have to pay, and after they've eaten, there's even left over. That's how good this father is to the servants. Now, these two sons are born into a house that works. They see a successful marriage. They see a successful house. They see the humbleness of the father. They see the humbleness of the mother. They see the father's love towards them. They see what the father's love towards them produces in their hearts towards the father. Meaning that the very love that they will have for one another, the very love they will have for the servants, the love they will have for the Father is all the Father's love. The Father loved them. And because on account of this love, they can now love, for they have love to love with. It is not their love, it's the love of the Father. If those same children were born in a different house, where the father beats the mother, where, um, you know, and where he's never at home, where the mother sleeps around, and all those kind of things happen, you will not find that equity of character in the sons. For there is not love wherewith they can love. So you cannot have love by yourself. God gives us love, or the Father loves the sons, and then from there the sons can enjoy the kingdom that the Father has already established, and that is the most effective way, or actually the only way, wherein these children could enjoy this family that they were born into. If we look at the life of the sons, we find that the good life the sons lived was all on account of the Father. The father shared his life with them. They were alive because of him. They exist because of him. Everything they possess was because of him. The joy they had in their hearts was because of the joy of the house. You know, if, as, as, um, if I'm grumpy at home, then everybody's grumpy. That's not how it is, isn't it? If I'm upset about something and I find my children are upset, everybody's upset. In the very same way, the joy that the children had, the source of it all was the Father. And what they beheld was the love of, of the Father towards those around Him. We're going to get to this now on, on how it pertains to us and Christianity and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The sons were partakers of the fruit that came from the Father and, uh, and the life they had was born from Him. They had no part 
in the labor from where the abundance came. Neither were they involved in establishing the kingdom of the Father. These children and everything they had was just on account of who the Father was. Now, <clears throat> let me summarize this and then we're going to go to the creation of man. God promised us life. So the life you'll have will be His life in you. There is only one life. It is the life of God. If that life doesn't live in you, you will never have life. That's it. Okay? You cannot take that life and divide it into different pieces. There is just one life. This life is what we call the Trinity life. The Trinity life. Where we find a Father and a Son inside the Holy Spirit being humble, self-sharing people that see the beauty of the other and see the worth of the other and from that platform they lay their lives down for one another and from that in, inside that truth we find great energy and great life and light come forth okay that is the only life there is this life promised you that very same light will be in you you'll have the very same thing so this life promised it so what it means is inside this trinity life between the father and the son and the holy spirit they will see that you have an experience of that life they will see it it's their promise to man man gets created why does god create man because he wants someone to feel what it feels like to be God. He wants them to feel the emotion of having peace. He wants them to feel what it feels like to see the value of another. He wants them to feel what it feels like to, uh, to be generous. He wants them to experience the, the rush of laying down your life for another. He wants them to experience the rush of someone else laying down his life for you and you finding life from it because the father find, finds his life from the son and the son finds his life from the father and the same towards the Holy Spirit and he wants to share that highest quality of life with everybody okay he wants to share it he makes it available just like the father of the two brothers made his whole kingdom available for the children what did the youngest do the youngest went and he took everything that the father gave him he took the knowledge the father gave him he took the substance the father gave him he took everything the father gave him all the knowledge that the father gave him and went to another country to do what to reproduce by the very principles he's seen in the house of the father he wanted to reproduce his own And what happened? It didn't work. It didn't work. And I'm going to explain to you how that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You cannot reproduce what is in the Trinity. You can only be included into it and it can live in you. Th that is the only way. Any other thing will leave you hungry and needing feeding swine wishing you could eat the food that is given to the swine but no one will give it to you even if you work and sacrifice hard in giving your life to the citizen of that country you will never have life for the only life there is is inside the father's house where the father lives his life in you by you simply believing that's it God comes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, lives an awesome life, creates man, says to man, you know, gives life to man. What happens with Adam and Eve? They go and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, just look at this picture. When God came and dwelt with man in the cool of the day, how did he come? As a monotone God 
that is in self-existence just a father in a bright light coming to dwell with you no the Bible says in the beginning God Elohim in the Hebrew it is the plural for God which we define as the divine ones created the heavens and the earth and God the divine ones Father Son and Holy Spirit came and dwelt with Adam okay so what happened the love that Adam beheld was the love between the father and the son when God came in the cool of the day to walk with Adam I don't see God coming alone down a little footpath I see a uh, a nice big road and I see um, you know through the woods and I see the father and the son you hear their laughter from a mile away as they are telling one another jokes as they are happy that's what I hear as the father comes closer to Adam and then after the eight of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil then God, nothing changed in God. After Adam and Eve ate of that tree, God didn't change. God's attitude didn't change, nothing. He came like in all the other days, and He came and He walked to Adam and Eve. And then Adam hid himself. And then He says, well, Adam is normally here, but where is he now? Adam, where are you? I am hiding, for I realize that I am naked. Adam realized that he doesn't have the ability to live like God and that all the holiness and life in him was an account of God living it in him and he couldn't live it. Unnaked. But when you try and use your own ability then you find your nakedness and then you're ashamed of it. But if you, like under grace, you're not ashamed if you're naked. I'm not ashamed to say that I can't do it. I'm not ashamed to say God must live it in me. I'm not ashamed of that. Let me explain the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said to Adam and Eve, Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now what is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said to Jesus, Good master, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Then Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? For there is only one that is good, and that is God. What Jesus was actually saying to him is, Are you saying that God is dwelling in human flesh? Are you seeing that I am God incarnated into human flesh? That's what he's actually asking him because if you can have that revelation, then you have, then you inherited the kingdom. You know, but the guy didn't answer him. He just said good for, that's just a way of talking. But there it says that the only one that's good is God. So if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good, what is that good? It's God. And evil. The word evil in the Greek if you read the Septuagint, it says to be full of labor, to be full of annoyance, to be hard pressed by labors. So what God said to Adam and Eve is, He said to Adam and Eve, and, and I must correct myself here, it doesn't say you shouldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says you shouldn't eat of the fruit of the tree of, the, of knowledge and good, of good and evil. What was the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Let me explain. It would be what would be produced by having knowledge of good and having knowledge on how to work the good to bring forth life. To bring forth fruit. The moment I eat of that, another word for eat, the word eat in the Hebrew is synonymous for um, belief. The moment I believe that by beholding the love of God, and then working what I see there in my own different country producing the life I behold I will die I will die I tell you I cannot I cannot explain to you in words what happens to my subconscious mind and my heart 
when I realize it's all about His doing. Where I find my holiness in the eternal life in the Trinity and not my doing. Not in my copying God, not in me, uh, you know, trying to be as holy as God or as righteous as God, but where I am the vessel and which is the recipient. I'm the recipient of His love and because I'm the recipient of His love and I know His love is for all people, His mind, His emotions and His thoughts for every man start to live in me and I find the thought of God towards my neighbor. I find the thought of God thinking inside my brain, feeling inside my emotion and actually manifesting in me by His power and His love and I see Him living through me. It is so close to me that I can actually confuse myself by thinking it is me loving the people. But in the meantime it is God living in me. And the only way He can have access to you is by you believing His word. Now, what is His Word? The Bible says that God came to reveal unto man the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What that means is, God took a human being and put a human being in the right, at the right hand of the Father, which means in equality with God. And the fullness of the love of God, the fullness of the glory of God, is now already inside a human. When I can make myself one with that human by saying that man there is me his life is my life I don't have to uh, the kingdom is established and now we hear about the kingdom that he has established the kingdom of God established is Jesus at the right hand of the Father which is a human at the right hand of the Father which is God's promise to every man that that life belongs to everyone when we believe that, then we find this spiritual truth enter our heart and the dynamics inside the Trinity starts to live inside us and we co-live with God. So, this might sound very complicated, but let me say it to you this way. By beholding the life there is between the Father and the Son, and trying to have access to his quality of life by doing the same will leave you dead. Jesus is not an example for us. He's an example of us. Big difference. We don't try to copy God. We are the recipients of his love and his love includes that includes the power of a new life so you know it's like I found myself saying Elena came and said you know there's a there's a lady a girl that she's teaching that's in a class final year she's in the final year and now her mom she's a single mom and lost a job in town she's been working for that place for I don't know how many years and they had to retrench so it's 17 people and she's one. Now she's got to move to Durbanville and she, she'll have a salary year of only 6,000 rand, you know, and she must keep the child in the school. And she's been there her whole life in that school and now she must leave that school in the final year and move to another school. Liana told me that. I said, well, let her come and live with us. We've got an extra room. I mean, let her live there. It wasn't a sacrifice for me to say that. I don't say they'll do it, but you know, that, that the mom would even allow or whatever. But in my heart, I don't feel I'm sacrificing anything. Because to God, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice to give His Son. We call it a sacrifice, He calls it love. He calls it normal life. So we don't live from a platform of, um, you know, I'm sacrificing this for the kingdom or I give this guy money so I've sacrificed some of my freedom. No, the Bible clearly says in Psalm 40, in sacrifice and offering, offering I've got no delight. God's plan isn't that you live His quality of life by sacrificing. His plan is that the life that we would describe as a sacrificial life, which is a normal life, 
would come and live in you by His power and you will feel how effortless it is to give something to somebody and the joy in it that's born from the revelation of the value of the other. Because that's how the Trinity has always lived and that's how they will always live and that's the highest quality of life there is. It is so high and so unique that it cannot be duplicated, it can only be shared. God cannot give you that life. The only way in which He can give it to you is come and drive with me and feel the rush of this, feel the adrenaline of this. I'll give it to you. Now when you can believe that the old man is dead, the man that found his life through sacrificing by obedience to the law, by trying to love his neighbor, by doing all of that, when you can sacrifice that and say, Lord, your life is my life. I see myself united in the Godhead. I see myself as sinless. I see myself as forgiven. I see myself as fully the God kind. And that when you can say that His life is your life, then you will find His life living in you and it will be no effort to... It's like the one, one guy came to me, he said to me, Bertie, how do you get everything done that you do? Because he went to my website and he's a local pastor and we showed him everything we've done. He said, I want to just see what you do. I also want to preach on TV and I want to preach on the web. Show me what you do. And I took two hours and I showed him how to do a live broadcast. I gave him all the programs, did everything. And then he says, let's go to your website and look at some stuff. And I took him, he says, where do you get the time to do this? I said, many times I work until 11 at night, you know, doing these things. He says, isn't that a sacrifice? I said, maybe to you it will be, but to me it's not. I find the life of God living in me. It's not a sacrifice. It would be a sacrifice not to do it. I'll have to sacrifice my freedom because I've been set free to do it. If I don't do it, I'll sacrifice, I'll sit there and suffer. Do you see the difference? The one is the life of God, the other one is not the life of God. So, don't eat of the fruit of the tree that says, Behold the goodness of God, work that own, that goodness you behold in this life, and then you will have the life you behold in that, uh, uh, in, in, with the Father. Don't believe that. It will destroy your life. It will destroy your life. Just say, Father, I'm the recipient of your love. I am, I believe that you. This is, this is what, let me put it this way. This is what Abraham believed. He looked at his own body. And the deadness of his own body. What does that mean? I cannot produce fruit. The Father said, I'll make you a great nation. What did he say? I cannot make a great nation. I cannot do it. Sarah's womb is dead and I'm a hundred years old. Or very old. Whenever God made him the promise. It was beyond the time where it was possible for humans to have children. And he looked at the deadness of his own ability and then he believed that God can bring forth a child from them. He even believed so much that when God said, sacrifice your son, that it was okay for Abraham for the power of a, uh, 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 his bloodline was not in Isaac, but in the God that can fulfill his promise. He can even raise him from the ashes, he believed. Do you see how the Bible says it was accounted to him for righteousness? Righteousness in the kingdom of God cannot be defined as my effort to duplicate the kingdom. Righteousness in the kingdom is to say he has brought forth a kingdom, his kingdom in the earth, in the resurrection and he promised me that I will be as immortal as Christ in the same holiness, in the same agape, and He will bring it forth in me, and I believe it. That is why Paul spoke so much about faith. There's been a, a great deal made about faith 
in the word of faith move in the church where everything was about how we faith for a car and a plane and those kind of things but very little almost nothing was made of believing having faith that whatsoever God has said he will bring forth outside of my contribution because God anyway made his promise to Abraham while Abraham was a sinner and he said to Abraham you will be a partaker of my kingdom by my doing Abraham just believed that's how God could enter the heart of Abraham how will God enter your heart how will the message of love enter your heart don't behold God the good and then think you're going to work that principle and by it have life let's make it very practical and I'm going to end off with that let's take marriage for instance you might have marriage problems and you might think the only thing that can heal this marriage problem is if I just love my wife more the wife can think that if I just submit more beholding the life in the Trinity and now thinking if I duplicate that life then my marriage is going to be saved no no that's not what you need you don't need to love your wife more you don't need to love your children more that is not the answer the answer is you need to behold who you are in Jesus Amen. and to the point that that reality becomes your only truth and then as, as you find that truth born in your heart you will think not you God's thought of your spouse will flood your mind his feeling about her or him will flood your heart and then he will live his life towards her and she he will live his life towards you in her and you'll never get divorced that's the way the key is not in let's look at the father what he does let's look at the son at what he does and I'm gonna solve my problems in this earth by duplicating that I'm walking in darkness and I'm gonna bring forth light by taking their works and creating light by doing it you're never gonna have it you're never gonna have it that's not the answer the answer is to see the glory of God in the face of a man to the point that God's thought captivates your mind to the point where his will becomes your will and that is all by his doing the only thing you do is hear what he says and believe that you have in Jesus been united with God we've been united with death in Adam how much more are we not all now united with God in Christ so let us not try and live the life of God let God live his life let me just read this verse Genesis 3 verse 4 and the serpent said unto the woman you shall not surely die for God does know that the day that in the day that you eat thereof your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods that word gods there as is the word Elohim it's the only place where it's translated correctly gods that's the right word where the Bible says in the beginning God that's the same word Elohim you will be as God knowing good and evil so what did he say he said listen God knows you will not die but you will have life you'll have the very life of God you'll have the light of God God knows it but he just wants you to be dependent upon him he wants subjects he wants slaves but you know what you don't need that you can behold everything God does all the good for only God is good and then work the good that's the word evil to work the good and what then then you can live with what life the same life as God and listen to what the, and I, I titled this the beautiful tree of death because God is beautiful and what God does is very beautiful the life in the Trinity is so beautiful but if you think you can do it and have life by it you'll die 
Listen to what it says. And the woman said unto the serpent, oh, sorry. Um, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant for the eye, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. So what she did was, she looked at the concept of the beauty of God and what's alive in the Trinity. And then she went and she said, if I look at that and if I do that, that can feed me. That can give me life. That, doing that, will make me as beautiful as what God is. It's desirable for the eye. It will make me as beautiful as God. So if I just love the way God loves, then I'll be as beautiful as God. And then he went on and said, desirable to make you wise. What does that mean? Let's look at everything God does and let's have this wisdom of how God does it. Isn't that wise? Look how God gives his life. Look at, and let's do that. Oh, that's, what, that's wisdom, man. Let's do it. And then she took the fruit thereof. In other words, she believed that she could have life by it. She, she, she took this fruit. Listen, this is the fruit. You can have this life. And she ate it. She believed she could. Finished. Died. And Adam was with her and she gave to him. She persuaded him of the very same thing. And then they couldn't live. They couldn't live. They died. So, let us not fix your financial situation cannot be fixed by you working harder, sowing money, giving money to the church, or anything like that. Your relationship issues cannot be fixed by you loving more, being more humble, or anything like that. The truth is that when you behold the love of God, humbleness will come to your heart, but it will be the humbleness of God. And that will change. That will have an effect on the one next to you. But to take the beauty of the good and to work it, to make what you see work in heaven, work here, will kill you. It is so close, people. It's so close. The actions are actually righteous. It's virtuous. It's wonderful. It's love. But to think that you can have life by loving, you're deceiving yourself. You cannot. You can only have life by God loving you to the point that His love lives in you. And then you will say, like Paul says, it's not I who live, but it's Christ living in me. To God, the Father of us all, all the glory. You know how, how loved I feel, how secure I feel when I preach this. Not just when I preach it, in this truth, I feel so secure because I know that I will not come short in any good work. I will now, with this in mind, I will know what it is to truly feel the very generosity of God inside me. To feel the peace of God where tomorrow, when I look at tomorrow, then tomorrow is not a problem anymore. Because I know as sure as what God is cared for tomorrow I am. For I don't live. And you know, let me end off with this. The beauty of this whole thing is this. That you didn't get lost in this whole equation. When you were included into the Trinity, you still remained you. You still remained you, although God lives in you and you want spirit with Him. You still remained you to the point that you can say, It is not I who live, but Christ that lives in me. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not I who live, but it is someone else living in me. The life I live is not I who live, but Christ living in me. It's like Eliana and I, we are one. Yet, she's Eliana and I'm Berti. The same with God. He's given us, He hasn't consumed us to the point of our own death. He's consumed us or he has made, made himself available 
and created us as a being that has got a mind, that's got a will, that's got an emotion and he pours it out inside us and the vessel can say, I can feel the substance I carry is God, not myself. Amen. Amen. Now you'll have to get the CD and listen to it again. Okay. I try to give little information when I teach, but it's difficult. <laughs> I mean, I can't hear you from my mom's brief. I can't hear you from your court board's copy. So, let's close our eyes. If you are in this place and you say, you know, I've tried my by myself to reproduce the kingdom of God I feel far from God and I just need the love of Jesus I want to give my life to Jesus I want you to right there where you are pray this prayer with me just pray say Lord Jesus Christ thank you for your love I've tried to produce life by my own but I can't I receive your salvation. I receive your life. I am innocent and I am forgiven. Your life is mine. In Jesus' name. Father, I want to thank you that I can pray for this congregation. Everybody that will listen to this message uh, today. And later, whenever they listen to it on the internet, I thank you that their lives will be deeply impacted by this message. I thank you, Father, that the peace that this brings is your peace and not the peace that the man can work up in his mind beholding uh, his holy life where it's about him and what he does for you. Thank you, Father, for the humble person that you are in establishing a plan wherein you can be the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you, Lord, that the Trinity is not the Alpha and we are the Omega, where we end it by our works. But you are the Alpha and the Omega. You're the beginning and you're the end that lives this in us. And we have got the privilege of having this joyride with you. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen.